Most welcome to this afternoon's seminar on uh, a very current issue being discussed, I think, in this room, but also in media today. What can Swedish Development Corporation learn from budget support era? I'm Torgne Holmgren. I'm a member of the expert group on aid studies on the committee. And the committee was formed some five, six years ago. And it represents a, a, a committee that is to digest and also analyze and evaluate Swedish Development Corporation. It's kind of a independent, even if it's a committee on the Foreign Affairs, Ministry for Foreign Affairs, it's an independent commission in the sense that the committee itself decides what to study and which studies to commission. And second part of this independence is that when we do uh, uh, approach authors or researchers to, to commission their work, they do it independent of the commission in the sense that they are uh, responsible for the report and also for the recommendations, etc. As of course there is a final decision by the committee to publish and also quality assurance of this or quality control of the of the studies. And today we will specifically of course look into the study that Jorge Dijkstra has done on, on budget support and she will soon uh, inform us about uh, her analysis and also outcome and recommendations coming out of that report. Eventually, we will also have some discussions, and I will introduce them while they are on stage. And after that, a short discussion between the discussants and the author, and then we open up the floor. And this seminar is sold out. So it's a very great interest here in Sweden on this current topic. But having said that, let me now introduce our first speaker, the author of the report. And I think you have got a copy. If you haven't, there is some copies outside on budget support, poverty and corruption, a review of the evidence, and it's also a, st a study that uh, Professor Dijkstra has done. Well, you have been looking at budget support for quite some time. And with your background as a professor of governance and global development at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam, you have looked into budget support and uh, program based support issues for quite some time. So it's a great pleasure to have you as an author, but also be in Stockholm today and to present your report. So please, you have the floor. Thank you, Tony. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming to the seminar, and also thanks for having the seminar in English. Speaking and listening in English, I think it's just for me, so I really have to be grateful to you that uh, the seminar is not in Swedish. Um, so I'm going to present, indeed, this report on uh, budget support. And um, I will start with an introduction and explain to you the methodology. Then, of course, uh, the largest part is on the results of this review of the evidence and then uh, in, in different parts, uh, intermediate effects first and then effects on the two main goals of budget support, on the effect on pol influencing policies and governance and the effect on poverty reduction, the eff in effect the, the very main goal. Uh, and then we'll end with some conclusions and recommendations. Okay, uh, what's budget support? I think many of you know. It is really non-earmarked aid. It's not tied to projects. And usually, uh, although the funds are not earmarked, it is accompanied by a policy dialogue. So the donors, usually it's a, a common effort of donors. They come together with the government and they discuss policies. It has become very popular since around 2000 in the context of all these debates on aid effectiveness, the Paris Declaration, that was 2005, but it was already debated before, uh, the context of the Millennium Development Goals, of course now we have the Sustainable Development Goals, but at that time it were still the MDGs, and the Poverty Reduction Strategy Papers. And it was then seen as really the most effective way to provide aid as part of the program-based approaches. In spite of that, uh, the volumes, they first went up until 2008, but after that, they declined. So, let's see some figures here. If it works, yes. Um, you can see here that the volumes have gone up, between, especially between 2003 and 2008. And then they went down, they went up again, but... In the past years, they have gone down. After 2015, they have, to have further gone down again. You have to look at the left scale now, the total 
general budget support numbers. And so they started with $2 billion a year for all aid receiving countries and it went up and its peak was almost $10 billion a year. When we compare this to total aid, that's the blue line, you can see on the right side the percentages, it was still quite low. In, to in terms of total aid, it was perhaps a bit more than, it was 5% on its peak, which is not so high. But we have to be reminded for the countries that have been evaluated for budget support, they have received a lot more in percent of their total ODA. So that ranged between 20 and 30 percent. Uh, so it has be been important for certain aid receiving countries. Swedish aid, but that's of course the topic also of the next speaker, Carl Anders Larsson. Uh, but for Swedish aid, the green, green line, budget support has always been higher than the average, than for the average donor. And that here it's also given in percentages, so you have to look at the right axis. Well, so in recent years, there has really been a decline with almost only the European Commission still providing budget support. Most bilateral donors have stopped it. So the main question to answer is, is this really due to the evidence on budget support? Can these lower volumes be explained by the evidence? What have been the effects of budget support? Well, this uh, review, like most evaluations, starts with a policy theory. So what was expected of budget support? And this is a picture of the original policy theory. Why was it assumed to be more effective than, for example, project aid? And this is a familiar line of an evaluation eh, from the inputs, throughputs, outputs, outcomes, and ultimately impact. And the ultimate impact expected was greater poverty reduction in the recipient countries. Let's first have a look at the right side of the, of the figure. This, was really, this is really the comparison with project aid. So if the resources are not tied to projects, then it was expected that the aid would be aligned with government systems, eh, government budgets, government's monitoring, reporting systems. Aid would be much more harmonized among donors and aid would become more predictable. That's, these are the throughputs. And all this, eh, this, especially this alignment with national systems, would strengthen the local systems eh, because you use them. It would lower the transaction costs and not all different projects with their reporting uh, requirements. It would lead to more macroeconomic stability, had the government could count on it. It would lead to more resources for poverty reducing sectors. And it would also lead to more democratic accountability because if the aid goes through the budgets, Parliament also has a say on it. It doesn't go around Parliament, it goes through Parliament. All this well, let's first start the left column, selectivity. The idea was that budget support would be given to countries in which donors have a certain level of trust in their policies. And so it was a little bit based on selectivity. And very importantly, in compared to the older balance of payment support, some of you will remember that, of the late 70s and 80s, there was a heavy conditionality attached to this balance of payment support. And most evaluations show that this conditionality for policies was not very effective. If the government didn't want to do things, it simply didn't do it. Although maybe cosmetically some changes were made. Well, it was expected that budget support would be based on ownership of the governments themselves. Uh, so, respect of ownership, and this would of course lead to a much better policy implementation. Both of these things would then lead to enhanced government effectiveness and this would lead to greater poverty reduction. So this was the idea. That was the idea that budget support would be effective. However, there was some schizophrenia in the donor community already in, the, in 2000, I think. Some thought, well, the donors should improve, should more harmonize, should align more with the, with the recipient government. But others thought, and maybe the same person thought, the recipient government should change, they should apply better policies and perhaps also better governance. So, in fact, the two things were a little bit mixed from the start. And this changed the policy theory, the actual policy theory. The right side remains the same, but the left side, uh, on their inputs, I now put in italics, 
the preferences for the policy dialogue. From the start, donors try to use budget support to change policies and governance. So there was this attempt to influence, and once that starts, harmonization among donors also becomes an issue on the left side, because perhaps not all donors have the same priorities. On the, on the outputs, we then have to investigate uh, if the donor desired changes in policies and governance uh, also are implemented. And governance here increasingly became to, uh, to be political governance, not just technocratic governance, which is about, for example, public finance management, but political governance, which is also about free and fair elections, human rights, etc. So what happened, in fact, was that budget support became to have two objectives, not just poverty reduction, but also improved technocratic and political governance. So in this study, in this review, we, I also looked at the effects on the attempts, the, effect, the, the, uh, the effects of the attempt to influence governance. So the three questions are first, what are the intermediate effects, the throughputs and outputs of budget support? The second is these influ this influence on policies and governance. And the third, the poverty reduction objective. So what is the contribution of the two budget support inputs, the policy dialogue and the resources, through their influence on government policies and spending to improvements in social indicators and poverty reduction? These are the main questions that are going to be answered. Uh, the methodology, well, basically it's a literature review. And the analysis starts with an earlier review that I did with together of my colleagues, Anthony de Kemp and Denise Bergkamp, for the Dutch Evaluation Department, the Policy and Operation Evaluation Department, IOB. <laughs> and we did an, already an extensive literature review. We did six case studies, and we conducted econometric analysis, cross-country analysis. And of course, I've, I had to review all the newer evaluations carried out, new academic literature and also grey literature, other types of studies. The results. First, the in intermediate effects. Well, uh, alignment and harmonization, yeah, to the extent that budget support is provided, it is aligned automatically with government systems and donors harmonize. In the, in the more recent studies, we can see that budget support was given by groups of donors be of between 4 and 19 donors. Most, in most countries, it was around 10. Uh, so that was quite good harmonization uh, effect. Uh, but for all these issues, uh, this is the first one, but for most issues, it holds, of course, that once some donors withdraw, uh, there is less harmonization and also less alignment, and this happened over time. The predictability. Well, at first there was an issue. Donors had to get accustomed to it, but in a couple of years, this was the predictability of budget support was quite good. Uh, but once there were suspensions for, for example, governance reasons, of course the predictability was also affected. And, well, the... I had to investigate, as I showed in this actual policy theory, whether donors uh, respected ownership or whether they tried to influence policies and governance. In fact, the attempt to influence became dominant. Comes out, that comes out of every study about budget support. Um, and also that political governance became ever more important. So the donors began to use this budget support instrument to try to change political governance. And this led to a kind of vicious circle. Uh, there was, once you set the bars very high, yeah, there was increasing dissatisfaction among the donors, and this led to ever higher uh, irrealistic targets in the area of governance. <laughs> Transaction costs, they clearly decreased as a result of budget support. So all those costs of preparing projects, monitoring them, etc. Once you give a bunch of money to the government, it's, it leads to a much lower transaction cost. But also here, once there, is, once there is more debate and more debate on governance, the transaction costs increase, of course, again. Macroeconomic stability improved, especially in those countries that just came from war that had a very low tax base to begin with. Then it helps, of course, if there is 
money going to the Ministry of Finance and they don't have budget deficits or much lower budget deficits. Uh, in, in most other countries, you can see that budget support led to more spending. And that was where it was, apart from macroeconomic stability, it was also meant to lead to increased spending for especially the priority sectors. And that also happened in all countries. And the priority sectors were often health and education, but sometimes roads, sometimes water, and it depended on the country. The 60% 60, 60 comes out in cross-country econometric studies. So on average, each dollar, euro, kroner spent on budget support, 60 cents was spent, was led to additional spending of governments. Uh, on tax revenues, there are mixed results. In some countries, they increased. In two countries, they decreased. In some countries, they remained stable. Uh, but yeah, on average, yeah, there, there is a kind of stability here. The effect on policies and governance. Well, first, uh, policies. Well, it was very clear that in the area of poverty reduction, and especially for these priority sectors, there was a coincidence of what donors wanted and what recipient countries wanted. They all wanted to spend more on the social, uh, social sectors. So in that area, it worked well. But if donors had demands beyond that, uh, changing, uh, abolishing subsidies or something like that, and it conflicted with what the strategic interests of the governments were, then the donors were not effective in changing this. So that is in line with all the research on the balance of payment support. There were positive, what we call systemic effects, eh, by using these government systems on the coordination of policy. Often the Ministry of Finance had a more central role and could coordinate uh, the other ministries. There were also improvements in public financial management. Uh, for example, more transparency, better classification of bud budgets, but most evaluations also write that uh, the situation is far from perfect eh? in, in the areas of expenditure control or also in, uh, in, in uh, administering local uh, expenditure. Things are not always perfect. And in two countries, there was even a deterioration of the public finance management indicators. These uh, improvements were not only due to the policy dialogue around budget support, but also due to technical assistance and the systemic effects are uh, using these systems. <coughs> there were, in many countries, also positive effects on domestic accountability, and especially by strengthening the supreme audit institutions, parliamentary budget and account accountability committees. In some countries, media and civil society became more active uh, because there was more transparency on budgets and they could use that. There were improvements in the legal framework for controlling corruption. So this led to more detection, but often the prosecution and the punishment was still uh, limited. Effect on political governance and human rights, very limited. Uh, we could say soft incentives like uh, sending people to conferences abroad or um, uh, let the, have them participate in international networks work better than the threat of suspension. So this led to many suspensions and withdrawals of budget support. Uh, one quantitative study shows that indeed more than 70% was due to political issues and to corruption issues of these suspensions. Factors on the donor side were also important. Uh, but these suspensions hardly had positive effects on the governance itself, but had negative effects on the quality of the policy dialogue and, as I said, also on many of these intermediate effects of budget support. Poverty reduction, well, this is the big surprise, you could say, because this was very positive. Economic growth, I looked at this because this is a kind of necessary condition for achieving also sustained effects in poverty reduction. Um, there were some effects through macroeconomic stabilization or through increased public spending. Um, I go the wrong way. Um, income poverty, redu poverty reduction, this was not very spectacular, but of course, if you give money to governments, you cannot expect, if that money is spent in the social sectors, it will take some time before social in, improved social indicators will lead to income poverty reduction. In some countries, there were effects through growth, but growth was not sufficient, like Tanzania, Mozambique, Burkina Faso, there was high growth, but not enough 
income poverty reduction. Yeah. Um, the most spectacular effect was on non-income poverty, social indicators. An econometric study that we did in 2012, the Human Development Index improves access to primary education, number of teachers, share of well-educated teachers in primary education, deliveries attended by skilled staff, and immunization rates. We found significant positive effects on all this. And these are from the more recent evaluations of budget support in the different countries, and you can see the years. Those recent evaluations have used sophisticated methodologies using uh, the, the heterogeneity by region or by policy of the government to really show statistical significant effects on certain indicators. Access indicators like enrollment rates or drug availability, but also outcome indicators uh, like the complete primary completion rates or reduction of or of child or maternal mortality. All these yeses mean that it has been investigated and that there was a positive significant effect. The only country where you see zeros is Uganda. Uganda clearly had different priorities uh, after some point in time and there they did, the, the researchers didn't find significant effects. Conclusions and recommendations. Um, well, as I said, the main question was, are these declining volumes caused by the evidence? And the answer is clearly no. Because if we start from the original objective of poverty reduction, there are clearly positive results of budget support. So the decision to reduce is not based on the evidence. Budget support has proven to be very effective for poverty reduction, and especially this non-income poverty, which is what governments in general can do. Eh? It's very difficult to, apart from these cash transfer programs, but it's very difficult to raise incomes uh, by governments. Budget support is not effective for achieving changes in policy and government. If this is against what governments, recipient governments want, donors can do very little to change it. And there proved to be a trade-off between these two objectives. So there was this first objective of poverty reduction, but the governance objective was added. And once all the donors gave priority to the governance objective, budget support became much less effective for poverty reduction. The recommendations. Well, the first uh, is, of course, to increase the volumes, given this very high effectiveness for poverty reduction. In those countries where a donor gives bilateral aid, that means these are countries where there is some level of trust in policies and governance, budget support is the most effective instrument. But donors should stick to return to the original objective and should not use budget support to improve governance in recipient countries. There are other channel, channels for doing that. You can use uh, just another dialogue separate from the budget support dialogue. So focus the policy dialogue around budget support on improving public financial management. This has proved, proven to be very effective in combination with technical assistance. And I think it's also very useful. It gives, uh, you can leave a long-term improvement in those countries. However, given the political backlash a little bit against budget support, if general budget support is perhaps too seen as too politically sensitive, uh, or, or there is a high risk of it being used for improving political governance, then perhaps the solution is to provide sector budget support, which some donors uh, actually do. <coughs> and the, the difference is not so big. Sector budget support is also non-earmarked, so the money goes to the Ministry of Finance, but the, the dialogue is related to a particular sector. So that can be health or education or water. Um, and then this could be a good solution to, uh, to deal with this. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, Hreske, for that um, uh, introduction, but not introduction, but your assessment and analysis of budget support. It struck me when you showed the, uh, some of the figures on the screen that uh, 
on the peak of budgets, what we were up to 8%, I think, in Sweden, maybe 6% in Dutch countries. When I look back and read the documentation or the agreements from Accra, uh, Paris, and Busan, the goal was 66% of project based yeah, approaches. Based approach yeah, 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 yeah. But it's quite short, in, in uh, quite a gap. Anyway, now uh, let me introduce the next speaker, and that is um, Carl Anders Larsson, nowadays an independent consultant. Carl Anders, you have worked uh, for quite some time in Africa, Asia for CEDAN, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and specifically focusing on this kind of support, budget support, and you have first hand experience from the country level. So, Kalanders, please tell us your analysis of the Swedish budget support story. Okay. So, thank you. Um, yes, I'm going to say something about Swedish budget support, uh, but. Um, uh, I must say, start with this. I, I, yesterday I read Geske's report, full report, and I must say it's very relevant also for Swedish support, everything. So I will not repeat that, but to say something more specific on Swedish support. And starting with this table, uh, we're talking about rise and fall of budget support. This is illustration of the fall of uh, budget support from 2005 up to 2016. Um, as you can see, uh, the volumes uh, have, didn't change that much during this period. But what really has changed is the number of recipient countries. Well, from the start, I think even before 2005, of course, we had budget support. And uh, quite a lot of countries, but it's been declining all the time. And uh, 2015, only two countries, uh, Tanzania and Mozambique. And after that, no budget support. I should say that this was written more than a year ago, so if there's something after 2016 that I have missed, please, somebody, if somebody knows, you should uh, tell us that. But I think that this is basically still uh, relevant. Uh, I will say something about the history. It's mainly about the history. And I'm starting even before budget support, because we have had non-project support has been provided a long time. Uh, already when I started uh, working at CEDA in the uh, 1980s, uh, we had a lot of uh, non-project aid, e in fact more than uh, when we had even the maximum of budget support. It was around 5% of total Swedish aid. But uh, in this period in the 80s, uh, even earlier maybe it was more than that. Maybe I think all around 20%. But it was called uh, different names, were import support, commodity support, balance on payment support, and debt relief. And all, all these forms of support were mainly seen as uh, uh, related to financing of a foreign exchange gap, uh, or maybe, or later also budget deficit. But it was never related to budget expenditure. So there was no discussion. There was, it was not, you, we didn't use the term budget support. Even it, it was a budget support, of course. Uh, and this was related very much to the pro structural adjustment programs by IMF and World Bank. Uh, even in this, this period, uh, the Ministry of, if Ministry of Finance was very active in, uh, the, in discussions about budget support because of relation to the structural adjustment programs. And, of course, this is included also conditionality, you know, traditional conditionality. And the basic aim was poverty reduction. Uh, I said, say, and then I, I, since I started this study in 2005, so I say, call this period 2005-2008 for the partnership era. Uh, we had the policy for global development. It was already 2003, I think. Uh, this was the basis for the new era in, in Swedish aid, I would say. Um, country strategies become more important, and budget support was integrated into the country strategies. So it was not a separate form of support. Before it had been seen as a very separate uh, type of support. Um, 
And it was linked, of course, to the poverty reduction strategies and to public finance management in the countries. Conditionality um, in a traditional way played less role in this era and was replaced by dialogue, at least in theory. And of course, this was based on uh, the idea of national ownership and trust. Uh, regard, regarding budget support, it was explicitly said in the guidelines that uh, Sweden should have high threshold for entry and exit. It was seen as a real long-term support based on trust. And I, 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 but this was <laughs> the question mark means, well, it was never Im implemented, especially not regarding exit. The, the entry maybe it was high threshold. Um, I come back to that, but. Exit was not a high threshold, really. It was, uh, I will also come back to that, because it was, uh, it, as Geske said, suspension was very common, suspension of budget support. Uh, and then we had the aid effectiveness agenda, of course. Alignment, program support, use of country systems, mutual accountability, management for results. All this is very relevant, specifically for budget support. And we have the MGGs, which made uh, stru uh, goal structure much more complex. 2008, 2010, um, we, I call the era or uh, period focusing on basic re prerequisites, or as Geske in her report says, underlying principles. Uh, this meant that um, selection of countries become very important, and was also policy of concentration of countries. Um, Risk for corruption become very important, and uh, the Swedish National Audit Office made a review which had a lot of influence, and was more focused on results reporting. And especially important, of course, human rights and democracy become one of the basic prerequisites, and more for budget support than for other uh, modalities of aid. This is very important, especially general budget support. And also the idea of fixed and variable tranches uh, were introduced. And also complementary technical assistance. Uh, budget support become been seen more as a package of uh, resources, dialogue, and technical assistance. Uh, then come what I call a U-turn in Swedish policy, which um, may have started a bit earlier, but important to 2011 and 2012. 12, there was a diff, uh, new uh, change in the view on aid effectiveness, really, after the meeting in Busan. And we also had a new government in Sweden, we should not forget. But that was earlier, that was 2006 already. But it uh, was very clear this, these years, I think, that national ownership, alignment, and use of country systems was very much questioned in official documents. And this was emphasis on political risks. Also increased results, uh, in, uh, focus on results-based management, even more than before. And finally, again, general budget support was limited to only four countries, which uh, Tanzania, Mozambique, Mali, and Burkina Faso. 2013-2014, um, introduced of result strategies in Swedish development cooperation instead of the traditional country strategies. Um, uh, general budget support decisions become, in my view, more political in this period, uh, since the more Minister of Foreign Affairs decided on these so-called entry values for, uh, for the strategies, and this included an assessment of uh, use of uh, budget support. Um, also increased government request for results reporting by CEDA and focus even more on visible results, which, of course, is a problem for general budget support because it, it is a general support. And now the latest 2015 question mark, is this the death of budget support? We can discuss that. Uh, one problem for budget support is that the, camp, the goal structure has become even more complex. Due many, very much due to the sustainable development goals. And uh, I would say, as I can see, there is, has been no clear guidelines for budget support in this new situation. I think that is really very much needed. Okay, 
Now the final. Why has the Swedish budget support declined? And as, uh, again, I refer to Geske here, uh, it's not due to lack of results regarding poverty reduction or economic reforms. Uh, in governance, of course, there is positive results in PFM reform. Uh, so that is the basis. But Swedish policy has changed towards more complex goals and more emphasis on human rights and democracy and more focus on results and management of mainly of political risks. Uh, and trust in recipient governments has declined. And this has affected mainly budget support and speci specifically general budget support. And that can be discussed why, because there is no, in my view, no reason for that really. But that is fact. In most cases, Swedish budget support has been suspended due to specific corruption scandals and political decisions that have not been directly related to budget support mechanisms. So budget support is used as a political uh, instrument, but it's not really related to, to the support itself. And I think all basically here is there is a lack of understanding of budget support by politicians, by some parts of the aid administration, including SIDA and Ministry of Foreign Affairs, media and general public. It is difficult to explain why provide budget support. I think that is a, a, that is a challenge for many of us. I think we believe that there is still some uh, room for budget support. So I stop there, I think. Uh, thanks a lot, Kalanders, and it's uh, interesting to learn uh, from your analysis and story also that I think uh, fits very nicely, also very well with the international trend. And you can ask yourself, or I ask myself, why, who is influencing who? In why has the donor community come from a peak down to zero, more or less a zero on the bilateral side? Now, you also mentioned politicians. And now I will invite the politician to our stage. It's Kenneth Forsland, uh, who is now a new vice chair of the Standing Committee on Foreign Relations at the, in the Swedish Parliament. And you are from the Swedish Social Democratic Party. And you have been a member of the Standing Committee on Foreign Relations for quite some time. And you are also a, have been a, an, are, is a spokesperson on, for the Social Democratic Party on Development Cooperation and also a member of Olof Palme International Center Board. Our idea was to have also Kjertil Lundgren with us today, but uh, we got the final minute uh, cancellation. I think she's handling some issues at the Parliament building right now. You can guess what. Uh, but you are most welcome, Kenneth, so please write your comments. Thank you very much for that introduction. I will, uh, in the lack of uh, Ms. Lundgren, do my very best to at least try to be rather bipartisan and not trying to uh, uh, overuse the uh, fact that I'm the only politician at the stage. Uh, first of all, I think it's very encouraging to read both of these reports because they point out that actually this is an effective method to be using in the development aid work. Uh, but we also have to dig into why is the situation, as we see it here, uh, described as um, decreasing amounts uh, from the, especially the uh, 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 country to country cooperation. I think that uh, a perspective that is perhaps scratched on the surface in the reports, but not really gone to its full conclusion, is the fact that today's politics and politicians, we are very nervous of critique. And every day, uh, or even every minute, the media is about to publish uh, political scandals. And as a politician and as a political party, you always want to uh, avoid creating a scandal. Because today's politics is very much about the next opinion poll and the uh, parts of percentages going up and down and trying to really 
understand why is a party going up or, or the trust of a party going down. And you don't want to be uh, linked to any scandals. And what has happened several times, and I could admit that I even used it myself, especially uh, during the times when I've been in opposition, uh, immediately where a scandal erupts in a country that we have a, a, a general budget support to, I raise the question, is it really fair and, and responsible to have this direct link between development aid from our country and the government in this country, which in many cases, or I would say most of the cases, the scandals are linked to corruption, the uh, 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 abolishing of, of uh, L LGBT rights, or uh, the uh, um, decrease of uh, uh, freedom of speech. And we rather rapidly tend to react towards these kinds of actions by saying, shouldn't we redraw the support or at least threaten them? If they don't uh, uh, behave, we will consider uh, uh, decreasing our uh, general budget spendings. And this has also been the case. It has happened in reality, time after time. I think that is why we're now down to zero countries in Sweden. Actually, I've been cherishing this uh, uh, method of supporting countries because I think it's a wise way to do it. It's efficient, uh, and you could really uh, um, destine the money where you want it to go. But at the same time, we have seen this uh, uh, development over the years with fewer and fewer countries. In one of the reports, it's mentioned that uh, the multilateral uh, 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 development aid corporations that are still using it more than in the bilateral frameworks. I think that one of the reasons is because that's a less transparent way to do it towards the voters and the, so to say, domestic audience back in the donor country. And it goes also for the fact that when it generally comes for EU policies in Sweden and in many other countries membering the European Union, it's always easier to blame Brussels than to take your own responsibility. And this goes also for this political area. And um, I would say that one of the things that I would very much would have wanted to read in those, these two reports is also an evaluation of what have been the consequences of general budget spending on other areas where we are not spending our money. Because one of the main critiques that we meet when we talk to the public audience and try to stay, stand up for this uh, method is the um, distrust in how it works. Because a lot of time we get to hear from its critics that, well, you only make it possible for corrupt regimes to use their taxpayers' money for other th purposes than they should be used. They could use it for building their own wealth or to improve the uh, defense spendings or the police spendings on a, a police force that is actually harassing its own population and things like that. And um, I think that that should also be put into this uh, discussion about how is really general budget spending working. Is it giving this possibility to the recipient countries, or is it actually not? Is it that we really fully create a, a positive development in the countries? I hope it's that way, and that we are actually not uh, in a kind of backward way uh, support the uh, armament and, and things like that of poor countries. Um, 
Finally, it's pointed out in one of the reports that one of the problems have been that we have been uh, putting uh, different or, or even uh, additional goals to the development work. And that, that has actually destroyed the effects or, or at least uh, decreased the effects and outcomes of the general budget spendings. Uh, I think it's important to have different and combined goals because I would say it's very crucial today, in today's world, to support and contribute to building democracy, transparency and uh, a non-corrupt environment. And we will have to find ways to be able to combine those goals with goals of getting more people educated, getting better health care and things like that. We actually have to be able to find ways to do several things at the same time because if we can't do that, we will end up somewhere in the end where we definitely don't want to end. Uh, probably with a better educated population and a somewhat healthier population but living under a rather terrifying dictatorship. So we have to find ways to, to combine goals. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Kenneth, for sharing the reality of today's politicians facing, probably, mainly, apparently, Scandals. I hope that the expert group of made studies will make politicians less nervous in the future, that we will help you on that road. Now, finally, uh, I will invite Sven Olander, who is head of Evaluation Unit at CEDA and also have worked on budget support and program based approaches for quite some time. You have also been working in Tanzania, which is, I guess, the main receiver of Swedish budget support over the years. So please, Sven, give us your remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, it's a pleasure to be here and to discuss budget support, which I've been working with for quite some time for CEDA, at embassies, and also at the European Commission for a while. Um, I just would like to start to say that it's, it's good that we have all this new information. We have had evaluations of budget support in the, in the past, but now there are more and there are better methods and they have complemented each other. So I warmly welcome this because it provides an opportunity to be evidence informed and discuss this. I just received this morning from someone in Brussels who knew about this seminar that they had a discussion on this and, and the Germans who also recently made the same type of, of study and evaluation uh, had declared that they are looking into possibilities going back to budget support. So that's, that's interesting, these, these dynamics. Uh, in general, as a practitioner on, on budget support uh, and manager, um, I think that it fits very well with, with my experience, uh, what's in the report. Um, and I would like to relate it a bit also to what a new report that just came out from the German Institute for Development Evaluation says about what happened when you stop with budget support, the exit. They show that it increased fragmentation, it, there were more projects and less coordination, less alignment. Uh, it had negative effects then on the possibilities to address these systematic, systemic issues. Uh, at the heart of how uh, an institution like the budget is working. Are funds reaching the poor? So if we are building schools, are there systems then for training teachers to have textbooks delivered so the procurement system works, etc. And budget support has been one way of handling this and, and this evaluation shows also that these type of effects and, and these broader 
sort of governance, technical governance issues uh, have deteriorated in the countries where there was an exit. And there was more, uh, less of a reform commitment from the partner governments and with some negative effects on social expenditures, for instance, on the public finance management. So it's interesting how these things uh, relate. Um, Carl Anders, you, you asked also what happened after 2016. Well, we have, from, from CEDA, we have had budget support then to Mozambique and Tanzania, that was the latest. In, as you mentioned in your report, in 2014 there was a decision to just continue with four countries, Mali and Burkina Faso. Uh, for obvious reason there was a coup d'etat in, in Mali, there was also a similar situation in Burkina Faso, so things changed rapidly. Uh, and in Tanzania there was an eruption of a, of a big corruption scandal, uh, and that together with other factors about democratic governance led to deterioration of the dialogue and then it, it, the instrument became very ineffective. Um, and in Mozambique we had a similar uh, thing happening in 2015, around 2015, with a big scandal uh, that made us really lose the confidence in how the government was managing the public resources together with the other donors and also with IMF, which they are still on off track with. And they, it's a, a, big, a huge problem for them to handle these debts that they, that they, uh, that they um, uh, took up uh, without following the, the laws. So, in a way, it's circumstances that has made GBS not to be uh, prolonged. On the other hand, there are all these other factors as well. Uh, and I think it's interesting to, to dwell upon a few things in, uh, in the review also and, and, and in the evaluation. Um, one thing is, of course, how do you go about this? We, we have the underlying principles, and they are supposed to be the way you select the countries. Over the years when we worked on, on budget support, they become more and more technified. So it became a very technocratic approach. I was part of leading those kind of assessment and doing those kind of diagnostics with the embassies. And uh, also in, in close relation with the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, uh, where we submitted these as a, as a basis for decisions in the, in the country strategies. Uh, over the time, we added more and more sort of technical features to them to make them really, really comprehensive. But in the end, I think a reflection is, can you resolve this, which is a genuine sort of political issue in the long run, if a country is, is uh, eligible or not for budget support. You can have these uh, decisions, but it's very hard to have this black and white sort of technocratic answer to it. And of course, that having those, and that's where I might sort of uh, disagree with Professor Dextra, is that if you have selectivity criteria in a sort of narrow technical sense, it will always become then an issue for every human rights violation, small or big, you can then ask the question, are the conditions fulfilled, are the underlying principles upheld? Held? And that becomes then you know, the way it opens up for that debate all the time. I think it would be fairer, uh, uh, working with it, to have more of a sort of political stance on is this an effective instrument in this setting? What can it achieve? How can we work with governments where the democratic uh, uh, room or, or the democratic development is going in the wrong way? while still doing things which are effective and in the long run we hope will work towards democracy. And these are the very, very difficult trade-offs that are hard to, I think, reconcile only on a technical level. So I think it's very good that we have this, this debate. 
going forward, I think we have experimented and, and we I was part of pioneering what we call result-based financing approaches where we looked at different ways of doing not budget support but something is similar which brings the sort of the, the best elements of budget support forward. Um, and in light of that there is another thing which I think has to be discussed a bit that comes out of the report. That's about the performance assessment frameworks and, and the conditionality. It depends on how you see them, what, what the theory of change is. Is it to leverage those results particularly? If you pay a bit more, then the recipient will do a bit more to, to, uh, to address this. Or is it another theory of change that has to do with, yes, maybe this will put that issue on the agenda for the dialogue and make people discuss it a bit more. Uh, think about how you solve these issues that comes up when you, when you do the follow-up. And secondly, it's also been a way, I think, to preserving uh, an instrument that has been effective in delivering the immediate objectives, as shown by, by Professor Dextra's report. Uh, by also saying, yes, it, it actually, there are some elements to it in terms of results that we can communicate. I think it would have been very hard to continue with body support as long as we did without having these sort of performance tranches uh, or variable tranches. And now we actually, from, from uh, so we have a few experiments with, with result-based approaches. We are, for instance, in in a partnership with the World Bank and the UK in Tanzania in the education sector in what's called a program for results. It has so far uh, not been thoroughly evaluated, but the monitoring shows good results. Uh, it's much more focused on, on, on key, key results in the education sector and uh, funds are dispersed uh, uh, loosely earmarked to the sector to be used for the sector. Um, we have other approaches which we have been trying at CEDA and that's, uh, for instance, social cash transfers has been mentioned as a sort of a body sport directly to the people. Uh, and there are also under other mechanisms which we've been trying out. Uh, so I think going forward, I think we will see more of this. The P4R program, the, the one I mentioned in the education sector, that's something that is growing rapidly with the World Bank. And when we are engaging on a bilateral level and we still want to be coordinated and harmonized, I think it's probably one of the most interesting options we have when there is a P4R in that sector to, to join it and work very much accordingly to these principles, but a bit more sector-wise. Um, So, I think to find a way forward, you have to be evidence informed and try to reconcile these different sort of notions, the political level, what can be supported by the public, uh, how, can you, how can you work with, with having instruments that are effective but a bit harder to communicate around. And probably there is an evaluation gap also when it comes to more of these new forms like the program for results and others that we need to, to fill and look into the future. How can we evaluate this and add to these experiences to see are these new ways of working effective or not. Yes, I think I will stop there, actually. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sven, and thanks to all speakers. You were terrific on keeping time. So we have ample time for discussion. So please join me on stage, uh, Kenneth, uh, Herske, uh, Sven, and Carl Anders.
And while they are taking stage, um, if you're not informed after the session, there will be coffee and tea served, so we can continue our discussion after we've ended it in this in this format. But let's start now, Jeske. Uh, are there any particular issues that you would like to touch base on what you heard from our three uh, interventions? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, let me try to respond. I don't know if it's on. If it's on. I don't see anything. But is it on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, you asked for the effect on other areas. Well, I think we investigated this. It has been investigated, um, and the, the result is that there is, in fact, no. No evidence that budget support increased corruption or increased defense expenditure. It really led to an increase in expenditure for the priority sectors. Uh, so uh, I think on that area, well, it, it's, it's quite good. <laughs> there is no, uh, there's no increase in corruption, at least. And what sometimes happens, of course, is that there is increase in, in detection of corruption, but we can see that as a good sign, because these institutions have been strengthened. Of course, there's still much to be done in terms of prosecution, but there has been more, the, more scandals, just for that reason, because, cor because budget support worked. Um, you said something about the underlying principles for uh, budget support. Well, I think underlying principles should be there for considering the bilateral relationship, an aid relationship anyway, not just for budget support, but for considering to support a government in the developing world. Uh, so uh, why is this only related to budget support? That's a little bit unfair. Why only related to the most effective instrument that we have? It should be related to the bilateral relationship in general. And the things you mentioned as alternatives, yeah, they, they, they come close to sector budget support indeed. Uh, so, but then why not mention, it? why not call it sector budget support and really leave it to the systems of the recipient country and not having the donor thinking about how to implement these, uh, this aid. Maybe these are the most important okay. things to respond to. If I can pick on what you just mentioned about what, how should donors react and can it, if there are Scandals, I guess there might be scandals in the future as well, and we have no budget support to withdraw. What should the donor do in the future in aid relationship? Well, the thing is that it's much easier uh, to reduce the uh, general budget support than to make reductions in other uh, areas where we are making uh, uh, corporations. Mm -hmm. So it's perhaps a little bit too tempting uh, mm -hmm. the fact that it's so easy to make reductions here. And since it's m much more complicated uh, compared mm -hmm. to, uh, mm -hmm. to do it in other areas, we seldomly use that uh, possibility, mm -hmm. even if there would technically mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. a possibility, because the timelines are, are so much longer, so you can't really get the uh, direct effect and go out mm -hmm. to the public and to mm -hmm. the media and say that well we have mm -hmm. now we have made this cut mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. spending area mm -hmm. uh, which you could do in this case mm -hmm. because if you do it in other areas it's it's long-term uh, 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 agreements it will happen perhaps in several years mm -hmm. future time mm -hmm. uh, Colandus I thought that um when uh, we had the Paris Agreement and Accra, and maybe eventually Busan, is it right to say that one driving force for general budget support was more or less the debt situation? We had the HIPIC with the PRSPs, etc., were driven by the Bretton Woods institutions, and the, the donor community linked them up to that, and now the debt crisis is over with. Is that why we see the downfall of budget support? Yeah, that's probably one reason. I mean, it was uh, as long as we had the debt issue on, on the high on the agenda, it was rather easy to, to propose uh, budget support or what balance of payments support or whatever we called it. So I, I, I agree with that. I, I just wanted to say something. I have a political economy idea about this. <laughs> Why is it so easy to end uh, budget support? Uh, I think it is because there is no not many interests in the donor uh, country or in, in the recipient country either involved in this. A project involves a lot of people. 
Swedish administration, consultants, uh, corporations, and also on the recipient side the same. But budget support is just a transfer of money. It's just Ministry of Economy and Finance in the recipient country has an interest, but even there it's, it's, it's not, it's, so it's very different. That's also why it's so more easy to use budget support in a, in a, as a political instrument compared to other forms. Uh, Sven, uh, I think both you but also Kerstin mentioned that the differences between the bilateral community, the only community and the multilaterals were, I think over the years, the multilateral support or financing is more stable by the, the balance goes up and down. Is that a problem or is that, uh, what does it make for the recipient country in their long-term planning? Yeah, start with Sven. Now, of course, uh, predictability is, is uh, important for, uh, for Ministry of Finances and, and uh, for the general public sector. Knowing what resources you have and, uh, is uh, key to being able to execute services efficiently. Um, so, predictability, I think we, we were pretty good at predictability over a long period because we uh, try to have the, the timing such that we knew when there were problems in terms of them. We communicated that, okay, performance has not been as good as we expected, mm -hmm. so we informed that, uh, we informed the recipient country that, okay, the, the payment will be a bit less than expected this year, so they could take it into account into the budget process. Uh, but you are right, I think, that uh, the European Commission and Others have been uh, more predictable than, than we have uh, over the last, last years. Um, having said that, I know that many of the World Bank's policy-based lending were not that predictable. Mm -hmm. So I think it depends from institution mm -hmm. to institution as well. And there are different hiccups uh, depending on the approach mm -hmm. chosen. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the bank's policy-based lending is more sort of looking for different actions that the government is supposed to be taking, the recipient government, and there is a lot of discussion and, and uh, postponement of those actions depending on, on how they are phrased, etc. So if you're pushing reforms that there is no ownership for and you have actions on that, there might be problems also in this person, the policy-based land. Rashi, I would like to comment on that. Yeah, uh, from the perspective of the re recipient country, it's of course better to have predictable uh, budget support from perhaps only the multilateral donors mm -hmm. and to have sector budget support, which is predictable mm -hmm. then, hopefully, from the bilateral donors. Mm -hmm. And what also comes out of studies is that having fewer donors, of course you have more, less harmonization, more fragmentation, but with fewer donors the budget support process works better. Mm -hmm. So in, from that respect, it could be a pragmatic mm -hmm. solution to have the multilaterals providing general budget support mm -hmm. and bilateral donors more uh, engaging in sector budget support. Mm -hmm. I will soon open up for, for, for you, all of you also to put questions and some comments. But one general question I have that if we are to provide, we as a Dumi community, support uh, governance reforms in the recipient countries, what kind of instruments should we do for that? Uh, do you have any? Idea, Carl Anders, what could probably the donor community provide to strengthen governance if we don't have the budget support as a means that it mainly initially was not meant for? No, I didn't really get your question, but I think it's um, talking about now alternatives. If you general budget support, we should not maybe talk so much about general budget support. I think more about sector support. Mm -hmm sector budget support. Mm -hmm. And also interesting in Sweden, I didn't say that, but there's always been softer uh, requirements on s sector budget support than on general budget support. Mm -hmm. this, uh, all these issues on human rights, democracy and governance have not been so much mentioned in sector budget support, mm -hmm. but it's exactly the same kind of support. It's, it's general support to the budget. Uh, but of course it's, it's coupled to a dialogue specifically on the sector and I think that's the way to go now that's the, and that's what, what we are doing and I know the EU is doing now mm -hmm. they are working mainly on sector budget support for 
different sectors. And then you can, of course, focus on specific issues more. Uh, even on governance, you can have a specific uh, sector budget support for PFM reform, mm -hmm. if, for example, mm -hmm. and then focus on these areas mm -hmm. specifically. The only problem with that is this uh, results framework, I think. It might mm -hmm. become very complex when you have this type of support, so, which is, I think has been, that has been a problem sometimes. One question to Ken, that uh, geopolitics might play a well, important role, maybe not for Sweden, but for the Dunder community at large. But looking into the right now, I mean, the, what is taking place right now in Africa and also other continents is that uh, there's a one major financial contributor, China, with heavy, I mean, the, in dollar terms, uh, they're dwarfing us. How should we relate to that in, in our general aid uh, relationship with countries that we have one, if not donor, at least a creditor to the countries that might even build up a new debt crisis? I think that that is actually one of the uh, biggest challenges that we've got today when it comes to development aid, especially in Africa, but probably in other uh, parts of the world too. And I think we have to be very patient and persuasive and pointing out the long-term benefits of sticking to democracy and, and doing things and building things that actually are sustainable. Mm -hmm. Because we, we could, probably all of us in <coughs> here, could mention one or several examples of, of uh, d Chinese development uh, mm -hmm. investments that we could be questioning uh, the quality of and the lack of, uh, of uh, long-term uh, sustainability for. And there are a number of examples of projects carried out by the Chinese which have been solitary projects and really are not functional. We, we all know that in this room. And we have to have a sincere conversation, I think, mm -hmm. with the recipient countries and pointing out the fact that, well, what we are wanting to do is perhaps not as fast and perhaps not as much money at the same time as if you cooperate with the Chinese. But <coughs> our uh, investments and corporations will be working better in the long run. Mm -hmm. And we have to try to build that kind of confidence and also to give them uh, uh, the possibility to be somewhat patient, sorry, <clears throat> patient about how fast could development really go. Mm. Thanks. Now I open up for comments or reflections from the floor, and there should be a mic somewhere. It's coming. So first, and then Mats left. Yeah, you should start, but we need the mic because this is online. We are 2018. Thank you. My name is Gunnel Axelsson. I come from Church of Sweden. Um, corruption, of course, is a major <laughs> reason why, why budget support is uh, discontinued. Uh, and in itself, it's really a lack of, of accountability. I think the most... <laughs> uh, dramatic form of lack of accountability. Uh, in, in your presentation, Professor, you mentioned that increased or improved national accountability was one of the effects, and I think that's really what we should aim at, national accountability. Uh, so I would, and, and you mentioned also the role of civil society there, so I would be very curious to hear more about that. And, and I guess there would be quite a range of different processes or that you can see in different kind of countries. So if you can share something. Herske, please. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it was not in all countries, but in some countries indeed, there was a more, I think it was Burkina, there was a more active role for civil society and the media and they could use uh, the increased transparency of, of budget processes, uh, better performance of, so, of supreme audit institutions, to also be more active and demand from the government more accountability. So, uh, yeah, not in all countries, but in some countries it worked like that. And in, in all countries you could see that these institutions for domestic accountability were strengthened. 
So it was also a kind of joint effect of the policy dialogue, but also some technical assistance. Eh? There has been a lot of technical assistance also for supreme audit institutions, and sometimes also for parliaments, for parliamentary budget committees, etc. Please. Uh, hello, my name is Mats Horsmar at the EBA Secretariat, but up till uh, two months ago I was sitting in Burkina Faso and was responsible for the Swedish embassy and the, the uh, aid program there. Uh, uh, we've heard uh, you mention alternatives to general budget support, and it seems as if uh, it's those alternatives that are the real options uh, nowadays. Uh, we were in our new strategy receiving the instruction that we could um, work with forms similar to budget support. Uh, and then we were thinking about uh, sectoral budget support, we are thinking about results-based uh, programs, uh, payment for results. Um, but I would like to pose a question to Kenneth, uh, because these forms similar to budget support, um, could you see but I, I fully understand the, the, your, your argument and your reasoning. Could you see a, a difference in these forms? And, and perhaps anyone else could answer as well. Uh, would it be really uh, doable to go for, for either sectoral budget support or a payment for results as alternatives to keep the good things of it and get rid of some of the difficult things? Please, Kenneth. Well, uh, thank you for the question. I, I think in many cases it's much easier to work with uh, uh, sector budget support because even if it's a horrifying government in a country that we really don't uh, uh, want to support the whole of it, you could probably find branches of it and administrations of it that is actually working or, and performing um, in a, at least somewhat decent way. And of course, these are forces in those societies that we should be trying then to strengthen and also take the positive sides. I mean, countries living in dictatorship and, and crisis, generally, not all of the society, not all of the administration uh, apparatus is totally corrupt. There are some signs of hope and, and, and uh, uh, streams of light that actually you should be encouraging. So I think it's a very wise way to, to act, to actually, instead of when it's not possible to, to go for the general support, then go for the sector support instead. Thank you. Any more comments or questions? Yes. Fourth road left. And please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Knut Tonstad. I come from uh, Norad in Norway, the, the counterpart of SIDA. Uh, I think that um, the situation when it comes to budget support is, is very similar. We have, uh, we have uh, stopped uh, budget support in Norway, uh, very much out of the same arguments uh, as here in Sweden. And we also, to a large extent, supported the same countries as uh, Sweden did. Um, I have a question. Um, it was mentioned here that um, uh, one reason for budget support was uh, the debt situation and, uh, and HIPIC and so on. Um, and, um, and now we see that the debt is increasing quite rapidly in African countries, but of course mainly to non-Paris uh, uh, club uh, uh, members such as China and, and private investors. But um, here comes my question. Uh, could the budget support and uh, a more active involvement of, uh, uh, of donors in the budget process in, uh, in uh, the African countries have contributed to a, a less significant buildup of, uh, of debt, maybe have uh, created a, a less serious situation? Thank you. Uh, maybe this is a question for all of Maybe Sven, do you have any comments on this? Link budget support debt to non Paris club members? Yeah, well, I, uh, I think it's a very interesting question. I don't think I have a, a very clear answer to it. Uh, I think there, the problem is, of course, that 
you don't want to bail out uh, these countries from debt that is incurred on terms that might not be the best and for investments that have not really rendered the development effect you would like to see. On the other hand, if there is a crisis and it's not handled uh, and we just stand by, uh, that might just worsen the situation. So I think it's a dilemma and I'm not really sure how that would be treated. Shreska, and ideas? Yeah, well, okay. uh, the link with debt, uh, at the big, at the, in 2000, of course, there was this big debt problem still of African countries, but the, the several initiatives, like the HIPIP, but also the Multilateral Debt Relief Initiative in 2004, 2005, it has really solved the debt problems. Uh, in the meantime, budget support was given. There are indeed some countries who have taken <coughs> on new debts since, since then, from China, uh, from also on the on capital markets. Uh, Ghana has been able to sell bonds uh, on the capital market, and so there are perhaps some new risks for for uh, for debts in some countries. But the situation is a lot better than it used to be. So uh, I don't. We shouldn't exaggerate the problem. I think. <coughs> And I would like to say something on corruption. I, I understand a little bit yeah, more. Sure. I understand Please. the concerns about corruption, but I also don't understand them at the same time. There is a lot of, of debate about it, but there is a lot of evidence that corruption is not the cause of the economic problems. There are many countries that have developed despite very high levels of corruption, like countries in Asia, like Indonesia. It had a very high growth rate and enormous amounts of corruption. So I think corruption will be there. If, will be there. We hope to detect ever more, and it will be become less with growing levels of development. I think that is the order. We should have, help these countries develop, raise the education level, and then corruption will also decrease. So uh, I think that is that. If you look at the evidence, that is the most likely order. So why <laughs> this enormous concerns on corruption, I sometimes tend to not understand them fully. <laughs> Any comments from uh, the parliament or parliamentarians? Well, I, I would <laughs> say that the instant uh, problem with corruption is how it affects the uh, uh, donor, uh, uh, um, the wish to don in, in the uh, donning countries. It directly affects the uh, Swedish public uh, when there are scandals in donor organizations or in donor programs. And, and we have seen several examples of that uh, in ordinary Swedish politics and, and in, in the Swedish society. There are some, some uh, um, organizations that have been in, in different scandals several years ago and they still are struggling to regain the confidence among their donors because of these scandals. This several is years, several within years organizations, ago. not in countries. Or... No, actually, not in not in the countries where they were active, mm -hmm. but in their own organization here in Sweden. Yeah. So I would say the public public audience is extremely sensitive towards mm -hmm. corruption. Mm -hmm. I, I could see definitely mm -hmm. the perspective that you point out that. In, in the development of a country, and for instance, we know the situation in Asian countries, there could be, at the same time, a high growth rate and a high amount of, of uh, uh, corruption. Uh, and in due time, probably, one will uh, deal with the corruption. Well, I can imagine that the tolerance for corruption here is is, is less. Huh? I mean, if, if it's Definitely the only Swedish so. organization that there's more uh, more indignation about it than if it's happening in other countries. Yeah. Karl Anders, any views on corruption or yeah. the debt, the mounting debt? <laughs> yeah, corruption is a big issue, of course, and um, the way we as donors can deal with that, uh, I think, is mainly. Uh, supporting uh, the PFM systems <laughs> because that is very important and we have seen some progress and that a uh, very important issue is uh, transparency, budget transparency and accountability, the key issue. And I have worked a lot now late, lately with um, Cambodia, which is a problem it has, with the country with a lot of corruption really. Uh, but there's a, uh, certainly been an improvement in uh, transparency and uh, accountability, 
especially at the local level. Then there are political problems, which I will not go into here. <laughs> so, um, but for, for the governance problems and corruption, I think that's the best way to do it. That's, that's working uh, through the budget. And also at the local level, I should say that. But I could provide also kind of budget support at the local level. And by the way, also to civil society. Civil society has a role to play, certainly, in this. And, and uh, in Cambodia, and thank you in many other countries, SIDA uh, and Sweden has been trying to support government and civil society as kind of package in, in governance reform. With governance, uh, government uh, is the supply side, institutions, and civil society on the demand side. And in the best of worlds, this can be combined in an effective way. When you mention budget support on local level, do you mean municipality, yeah. region, district, yeah. or, yeah? yeah? Okay, interesting. Because I think we are providing, we, Sweden or the donor community, at least the government to government on, on the federal national level, but you mean that there could be a direct link between a donor and a have you any examples of that? Yes, we have. That is Cambodia. I'm, re I'm thinking of Cambodia. We have supporting decentralization long time, and and that has been partly a budget support to the okay. local level, okay. the commune level. Unfortunately, as I said, now big political problems. So we don't know the future. Okay. Any more? Yes, please. Uh, fourth row, third chair. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Johanna Lindgren Garcia. I'm an independent consultant, uh, also part of a network called Adelante, who works a lot on, with, the, with the European Commission on uh, budget support uh, matters. Um, a few different reflections, but um, one, uh, my first one uh, relates to, I mean, obviously the budget support, the results are showing it, it, it promotes growth, um, and that's great. Do you have any reflections in terms of, I mean, were there any indications on measures of inequality? Um, was there, I mean, growth with equity, was there any evidence around that, um, or is the time frames, were they too short in order to be able to capture that? Uh, so if you have any, any reflections on that. I was thinking also CEDA um, provides support to one of the largest gender budgeting programs in, in the world in Ukraine. Um, there, for example, through the, the technical assistance in, in gender budget, um, gender budgeting, really there we're seeing that that there, there's a lot of improved public spending that's that's happening. So 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 there there's also that's would that be considered a form of, of sector but or, or budget support, um, technical assistance? Um, are there ideas maybe of adding adding some support to to that? Um, so that sort of package into my my, my equity uh, question. And then, um, uh, if, if I may have a second. Yes. Yes? Okay, Go thank ahead. you. Um, uh, on the other forms of support, um, uh, we're, you were mentioning results-based support, uh, different cash transfer programs. Um, uh, we, we have all read and, and heard of, of, of similar issues as, as uh, sector and budget support programs have um, when it comes to corruption or uh, in, inappropriate use of, of monies. Uh, that the most recent uh, readings we were um, received from from Zambia, for example, on the cash cash programs um, that were there. So clearly, they, they these programs, these similar budget support programs, are suffering from the same issues that maybe sector budget support or budget support um, would 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 have. Um, with the additional issue, though, that they come with additional transaction costs. Um, is this an accurate reflection from my side, or um, would you want to correct me on, on this point? Is it is it simply is this a more politically palatable but more expensive um, locally from the, the part of the recipient um, form of, of aid? Thank you. Let me start with Hertha to comment on these two issues. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. For, first, it's good to to think that. To remember that when budget support started, the donors did not have a good policy theory on how budget support would reduce income, income poverty. So there was no theory about the relation between growth and equity. I think now it would have been different, but when it started, the donors did not think about it. It was the era of the, the Millennium Development Goals. They were mostly about the social sectors, although income poverty was the first NDG, but nobody thought about that. It was really mostly about the social sector, and I think there was a naive idea that 
uh, growth would, would, would deal with that. So it was not necessary to do something extra. And I think now it would, it would be different. Huh? If, if donors would now think about general budget support, uh, there would be more ideas, hopefully, <laughs> about how growth would uh, be combined with, uh, with equity. And also, I think uh, this whole, uh, these whole programs of conditional cash transfers or cash transfers without conditions, uh, that would be integrated in budget support probably in, in the policy dialogue that, that there could be technical assistance, assistance for setting up these kind of, uh, of programs. Um, gender equality could indeed also be part of the policy dialogue. I think that it would be different now than it was at the early 2000s. Um, the other thing is maybe more something for Sven about the, uh, the results-based uh, project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have no questions? <laughs> yes. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, well, just to mention that gender budgeting is something we actually uh, supported in, in several countries. We were part of uh, also doing the public expenditure reviews in Zambia, trying to get them to integrate gender when looking at the sector policies, etc. So it's been something we've been doing in, as a complementing measure in, in, in several countries when it came to budget support. Um, and just on this with, with equity also, I, th I think it's a very valid point that uh, if you remember the HIPIC, it was about the HIPIC savings. What were the countries supposed to be doing with the funds they saved when they didn't have to serve the, the debt? That was the preoccupation of the time. And for, from the start, the first countries had to do spending plans for this, which were approved. And there sort of it became that it was the social sectors that you wanted to augment and you forgot a bit about the, the other sectors. Uh, so, yes, but I think through budget support uh, we have been keeping a very close eye on the economic policy and looking at following up and having a dialogue on what's happening. There is an example, I think, from, from your report or maybe the Orthlanders from from Zambia, where we <coughs> tried to push agricultural policies that would be more pro poor We didn't do that, and that's seen as a failure. I was personally there and, and, and part of that dialogue, and I, I do think it was the right thing to put the issue on the table. Without budget support, we might not have done that at, at all. And I think that's, that's also a key issue. We, there, there might be times when you disagree, and, and but at least you are talking about the serious things that are uh, <coughs> in the policy dialogue that you should be speaking about. Um, on the new forms, are they just adding transaction costs? I, I really don't think so, because in, in most sectors there is a need for a sector harmonization and coordination, and there is a, a need for a sector approach, and these programs very much support that kind of approach. We can see it with the P4R in education in Tanzania, it becoming sort of the vehicle. And the Global uh, Partnership for Education uh, that have a, uh, that's also very active with a huge funding in, in Tanzania are now using that as mechanism for their own result-based tranche that, uh, that they have nowadays. So I think it actually helps at the sector level to reduce transaction yeah. and, and and, and to align the sector financing with, with the national system and the budget. Uh, yes. Colin, there's any comment on these two issues? Or? No. Then we go for final robot one. Per, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Per Trulsson. I'm an aid coordinator at the uh, Department for Asia and the Oceania of the Pacific at the um, Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Um, I thank you all for a very fascinating and, and an interesting discussion. Uh, I think it's touching a lot of very important issues. Um, I would just like to shift perspective a little bit to, to come to a slightly different issue arising from the presentation that uh, Kenneth Hasta did. Uh, and I think I thank you for that one in particular because I think it was very fresh and frank from, from the perspective of a politician. Um, what I am thinking about is, is the fact that um, we have been reconfirming the principles of Paris, Accra, Busan, and I, when I say we, I say the international community for so long, 
Uh, and there's nobody really that's saying, no, stop this. Uh, we don't believe in this anymore. We have evaluations that say the same thing. Budget support is probably the most, the best thing we have around. Uh, we may be looking at alternatives, but it's still, you know, it's about budget support in one way or another. We even talking about using this in post-conflict countries where the state is very weak, but we find it's a good way of working somehow with building the, the capacities and the structures of these countries. Um, so if it's so effective, what, why aren't we doing it still uh, with lust and, and, and energy? Is it simply because it's politically difficult to do it, uh, that we are afraid of what the public might say? then why are we not working with the narrative around providing budget support and providing aid that is risky? So my question is basically, um, what kind of risk mitigation strategies might we develop in order to provide the aid that we in basically seem to think is the most appropriate aid to provide? Kenneth, okay, will you start on this question, please? <laughs> Sorry, do you have a question linked to this? because this is the final round. Is it on? Hello? Yeah. Yes. Uh, very short link to that. Um, I'm, I've been thinking about there's um, a contradiction here in, in the presentation that yes, the result is very strong. And then one of the reasons why we couldn't continue is because of the results agenda. And there's a contradiction. So that I think it has to do with how do we talk about results? Okay, let's make a round. Start with Kenneth on this very basic question. Should it reappear or why not? I think it's a very interesting perspective to start talking about how should we actually uh, compose the narrative describing what we are trying to do and what we want to do. Um, that is one thing we could do. Uh, the other thing I think we could do is start looking for countries and uh, sectors where they actually um, have a, what should I say, positive or, or uh, at least some kind of, of uh, long-term democratic and open ambition that could be supported and, and actually could be the, the uh, foundation for a good cooperation between Sweden and other countries towards uh, recipient countries and recipient sectors of those countries. I mean, even if they are uh, uh, an undemocratic government or an undemocratic branch today, if they have a long-term understanding and, and respect and goal of becoming a democracy, I mean, that is certainly something that should be promoted and, and supported, I think. And it's very interesting what you mentioned about working with how we build up the narrative around this. Carl Anders, any view? Uh, yes, uh, results are, are of course very important. So when I said that that has been a problem in a way is because what we mean with results, which we mean uh, a lot of quantitative, and I think during a period Sweden uh, introduced a lot of quantitative uh, results reporting, uh, which was not very meaningful and very, uh, and also high burden for the recipients, uh, including the civil society also. Um, I think that it's still there is a lot to do. We have to find ways to present results and especially, of course, on, on budget support since it's not possible to, to attribute uh, the resources to specific uh, activities. Uh, I think um, there, there might be some good examples. I mean, um, Dextra they, yes, probably knows much better about that. Uh, I think that's something that should be worked on uh, a lot. I was also thinking about this underlying uh, principles. Of course, they are changing. I mean, we, it's not possible to say uh, 20 years ago a country was very good for budget support, and it's still the same. It's changing, so we have to do it continuously, continuously increase our understanding of the processes in the country. It's, it's really about understanding, and it's very complex, uh, I think. 
to, to understand the long-term uh, development of a country. So it's, this is a problem for, uh, for all kinds of support, not only for budget support, of course. Sven, any comment? No, but I think this with the, with the narrative is very important and I think that's partly why these result-based financing approaches are, might be uh, uh, appropriate uh, because they, if you focus on a more narrow area and as shown in the report you might be fewer and you have a clearer understanding of what the objective is and what results you're actually pursuing. Uh, you find that area where our our objectives and the recipient government objectives coincide, and there is will, a will, there is ownership for this. Even if we don't, we disagree to agree on other areas. Uh, there you have opportunities, and then you have a narrative that can be told that people can understand. Yes, we can be in the education sector in Tanzania and promote girls' education. It's important. We have a program. It, it's about these five, six, seven results that is understandable, and we can show progress towards that. Not using them, um, also adjusting all the time and, and learning. And I think it's not really about conditionality, of course, in result-based you, you pay after actually the results are, are reported and, and verified. Um, and that means you need to be very careful in how you design them. You don't want to set up anyone from failure and you don't want to uh, create to, to, uh, to uh, you don't want to have the bar too low either. Uh, but it's about the learning process, so you can change. If it shows that, no, this is too hard, you change this, and you need to work more in an ad ad adaptive management sort of, of process and, and agree to sort of discuss what is it possible, what can you do, how can we change this? But with a, with a very clear sort of objective in mind, uh, I think that's easier. I think it was hard to sort of look at, at all the sectors at the same time and... and uh, that's part of why the performance assessment frameworks we discussed were very sort of blurred and they changed all the time and it was hard to find sort of a really a common view on them. Uh, I think with, with the, the, the result-based program we, we uh, actually have in, in Tanzania, uh, we managed to do that, is focused on the, the core issue of budget credibility because one of the big issues is the structural overcommitment of the budget that makes uh, resources that are budgeted are not really going out to service delivery entities. You can never sort of trust that you have the budget you, you think you have. And it means it's hard to, to of course, to, uh, to manage a, a clinic or a school or whatever. And these sort of core systemic issues we try to address through, through this. We don't think it's, it's going to sort of our funding going to incentivize uh, these enormous shifts in policies that are needed. But we're going to pick it up on the table and we're going to discuss how it's going and we're going to have a dialogue on that and there are technical assistance. So it's, it's very narrow, sort of, in a way, instead of it's sort of broader. And that's also a way of having a, a narrative that is easier to explain uh, what are we doing and, and why and what are the results of this effort. Thanks. And uh, the final comment goes to uh, Shask and also a question that we maybe could continue to discuss uh, out in the coffee lounge area. Do you see that budget support or general budget support will reappear among the DAC donors in the next five years? <laughs> yeah, um, I would hope that it uh, reappears. I think an important part of the narrative about foreign aid in general is that it is a risky business anyway. Um, and what my report shows is that budget support has been very effective for poverty reduction, but also for improving the systems of public finance management, of public accountability. Uh, for, my, for me, the second best solution would be yeah, the sector programs, but then you miss the overall, the broad perspective on public finance management and, for example, some public <coughs> accountability mechanisms. 
So uh, my preference would be that uh, we, we turn indeed to general and sector budget support, also as bilateral donors. Um, the last man who asked this question also talked about fragile states. There is a lot of evidence that, in particular in fragile states, budget support and the previous forms of program aid have worked very well. For example, Uganda used, was a fragile state in the 80s, of course, after the Civil War. And it did very well with, with these with general resources to the budget. It managed to, to keep its expenditure in spite of very low tax revenues at the time, so, and avoiding uh, large budget deficits. So I think both in fragile states and in more advanced states where the tax revenues have increased, it is, uh, it, is, uh, it is still the most effective aid instrument and it can indeed also be used for having these kind of strategic issues, strategic discussions with governments on, uh, on poverty policies, on equity, yeah, growth with equity, things like that. If donors have visions on that, they can use budget support for that and those opportunities are lost if you return to project aid. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And the question is whether we today have uh, witnessed the rise and fall of budget support. And that leads me to another question. Is this also the end? Well, yes, the question is, is the end of the aid effectiveness agenda or the principles, harmonization, coordination and predictability? Because I didn't hear much about that nowadays. Are those bygone days and what is the future? What does it hold for us? And that we should continue to discuss uh, at the coffee, not break, but the end of this session. But first, uh, join me in big hand for our Kenneth, Falanders, Gershke and Sven. And now it's time for advertisement. Next EBA seminar will take place on 16th of November, a month from now. You should not be here, you should go to Stockholm Messan, the Stockholm International Affairs, because at Emmerdagen on Human Rights Day, there will be a seminar on aid in time of shrinking the democratic space. Oh. And go to our website where you will find all about seminars, reports, blogs, whatever, eba.se. And now, coffee. Thanks for coming. Okay.